Hi, I'm Tom Migot from Tom Migot Photography and today this is a new episode of Capture It with Tom Migot's Friend. You guys may have noticed but uh, last month I finally um, did a new contest after so many months of absence and the theme for that contest was Beauty in the Nude. And so as you can see on the screen, uh, we had uh, 29 members for this uh, very specific contest and over 32 pieces of artwork. Uh, so it was really interesting and in seeing some uh, fantastic work. And as usual, uh, you guys know the process now, the, um, the winners usually end up doing a, a video with me uh, just so I can share their work with you and uh, we can all uh, get into the, um, the detail, their own vision of photography and maybe talk a little bit technical as well uh, just to be a little bit geeky and figure out what, uh, what gears they use. And this month I'm very pleased because that was my, uh, that was my choice from, uh, from the moment uh, that photographer posted it. I said to my wife, actually called my wife and I said, have a look at this one because I totally love it and I just hope that he's going to win uh, this month so I can actually talk to him. So um, the winner is you Smith. Hi you, how are you doing? How are you doing? You, you, pretty good, thanks. You, you, um, you live in California, don't you? We do. We live about as far south in California as you can get without being in Mexico. Is that San Diego? San Diego. All right. All right. And so your piece that was brilliant, it's the ballerina in chair. So you guys see it on your screen. You doesn't, but clearly knows uh, which one it is. It's a fantastic piece, black and white, beautiful figure of that true ballerina. Uh, as you can see, she's got the legs for it and the whole physique, a really beautiful uh, lines. I love the light, you. I totally love it. Uh, the way it just, you know, go along the legs. Really, really nice work. And uh, what's interesting is that it's uh, it's black and white, but the background is all black. And ha having her sitting on a chair could have made the chair quite invisible. And I really like the, the mm -hmm. tiny p light that you have on the back of the chair. And especially the fact that that chair is not just a regular chair. It has some fine carving into it. And I think it really adds some value to that shot. I really love the shot you did, mate. Yeah, thank you. We All we did really with that one is we used a 45 degree uh, or a light off 30, 45 degrees uh, to her right. And it was a six foot softbox that I use a lot. And if you get the exposure right, everything else falls into place. I like, I like angled lighting because it, it contours everything and emphasizes the form. And, and Joe, uh, the, the Jocelyn, the, the model, was perfect for the shot. I think I've seen all those shots with her in, uh, in the ballerina outfit. So how long was that session? Was it several That's, hours? Believe it or not, it was 30 minutes. Wow. That was, and that was not by choice. Because normally my wife and I, who sh we shoot together, and normally we take two, three hours depending, because you know you do a lot of planning, you get the lighting just right. But with Joe, we, um, we basically, she, she went into the ballerina uh, slippers and I set the lighting up, did a couple of test shots. And about 30 minutes into the, into the shoot, her boyfriend says, okay, we have to go now. And I go, what? He said, we have to go. She's got to go to Milan tomorrow. And I go, great. So I had my makeup artist there. We had everybody there. We literally only had 30 minutes, and I don't think we took more than, I'll bet you we didn't do 50 shots. Wow, that, that's really, really good. That's yeah, that, that was, if I hadn't gotten a good shot out of it, I'd have been upset. So you, you hadn't planned that particular pose? Generally, we, we, generally we choose the, the poses, mm -hmm. um, and with Joe, we knew that she was a ballerina, and uh, so we basically went with, with two props, and that was the, ball the uh, ballet slippers and the, um, the, uh, uh, the kind of the veil yes. that we put over. And those are the only two props that we used. And actually, because you're talking about the veil, I'm going to show you guys uh, another um, exposure from you um, with the veil. So this is the ballerina, um, and so it's the same person as you can see. She's still in a nude, but just covered with that long veil and fantastic legs. Uh, 
According, I mean, the light is still a forty-five, roughly a forty-five angle as well. Right. So really, so really, really, really nice. And I think it's fair because uh, you said we on multiple occasions, and I think uh, it's fair to tell our audience here that you're not uh, working on your own. You're also working with your dear wife, Diane. Yeah, Diana and I work together all the time. Is, and <laughs> once in a great while, she'll say, "You shoot today." I'm gonna, you know. But for the <laughs> most part, we shoot together. And it does add something to, to the, uh, the uh, shoot for lots of reasons. Diana, for, for example, will see things I don't see um, for, for obvious reasons. And she also has different ideas about where she wants to go with the shoot um, because she does a lot of composites mm. in Photoshop. And so she'll see something in her head that I don't see. So it, it really, and it's, and it's a big help with the models too, because they feel more comfortable, I think. Yeah, no, I, I must admit, I mean, that's that's good advice, guys, that you is, is giving us here, because I, I've experienced it myself uh, with my makeup artist. My makeup artist happens to be females, and trust me, it really helps uh, when you do not have any, um, any shots to show to a potential model that you've done previously uh, with all the girls, all the women, uh, in the nude, and because we're touching here uh, such a specific um, subject of being nude, and it's not a natural um, state in our day and age, that you right. know it's very difficult sometimes to uh, to get this trust between the model and the photographer. And if you have a makeup artist, if you have a, a friend, if you have a wife uh, working with you, it's always a good thing. And 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 if you don't, maybe suggest your model to bring a friend of hers. Just to make her more comfortable, and uh, you know, I've, I've even suggested sometime uh, go shoot at her place. Go shoot somewhere where the people are gonna be comfortable. And I, I think you has a has a studio, uh, so uh, I think it's uh, it's better over there. But it really does help credibility. We generally our makeup artist, as you said, our makeup artist happens to be a woman as well. And between um, her being here and Diana being here, that's a big help. It's amazing how much difference it can make. I don't personally like them bringing somebody because they generally bring their boyfriend, uh, and that just puts a quash on it. Yeah. Because oh, I don't want to do that, or I don't want to do this, or you know. Mm. So whatever. Now, I think the bo I, I I would agree with the boyfriend. <laughs> uh, when yeah. I say friend, I meant a girlfriend. I didn't mean exactly. a, a boyfriend. Definitely. That'll work. And um, so I I also want to. Touch something here because um, we have young photographers that may uh, watch us today and they may never have experience shooting with flashes and light and, right. and working in a studio and they may think that you know the, the shot of the ballerina for example requires a lot of gear fancy cameras fancy lights very expensive continuous light and you can't do it with your own flash a tiny um, uh, a tiny brolly or and you right. said you only use a soft box. And yeah, well, I, I use the soft box uh, for the obvious reason that it looks like uh, soft sunlight or moonlight coming through a window. But, you know, we, we've shot, I don't know how many things we've shot with our 585s on our, our Canon. If you just hold it off camera, you can get away with it. Or just shoot um, uh, available light. You know, that works. In fact, in many ways, available light's a lot better than shooting with a strobe anyway. Because when you shoot, yeah, you know, when you shoot with a strobe, you know, uh, you got to you've got to do a lot of pre-visualization that you don't do with available light. And that actually leads me to uh, another exposure of yours, uh, the nude with the hat, which I I believe is shot outside because I see some, uh, some some green leaves behind. Although it's a black and white shot, but I, I right. suspect we have um, trees or, or leaves at the back. So what's that natural light? Uh, can you explain us what uh, what's the behind of the scene? We shot that in the model's garden, and uh, we went out back, and we were shooting, and um, I saw this uh, uh, wicker rattan sofa, and we had the hat. We put the hat on. It was direct sunlight over overhead, which is horrible light to try and shoot in. Very harsh, yeah. You know, and so then what I did was I just turned around and underexposed it, because I, I bracketed the shot, and that one's about... Oh, probably two stops under. And so what I did when I printed it and brought it up in Photoshop, it was already pretty angular in the lighting. 
And so all I did was just uh, uh, darken it down just a tad, and it gets that dramatic effect. And of course, I had her put the hat on because mainly the light was just horrible. Mm. So I, it, was, it was one of those grab shots, you know. It's, it's quite, I mean, it's quite nice what you've what you've done because, as you said, it was arch light, and we can see it because uh, on um, her left arm we could see that it's it's slightly overexposed, and you could think, right. oh my gosh, overexposed. I can't I can't have my picture you know published with being overexposed. That's that can't happen. Well, in fact, guys, you can. It all matter what you want to pass as a message in your in your final exposure here. The, the part is slightly overexposed because it's not as sharp as any other part, like the nipples right. or, or, or the, um, the belly button. It right. kind of gives kind of a, a mood, this blurry mood around it, almost ghosty. And, uh, and I quite like the result. It's not perfect exposure-wise, but the hell we care. It's, really, right. it's, it's a really nice exposure. That's all it that matters at the end. You know, some of the best work that's ever been done by, well, a perfect example, I think, would be not in a nude genre, but if you look at uh, Robert Kappa, his famous photographs taken at D-Day, when they're all blurry, well, it turns out that uh, an overzealous uh, new guy in the lab in London left it in the drying cabinet too long, and the emulsion actually melted off the film. <laughs> but it, look what it did to the photograph. The photographs of D-Day on Omaha Beach are absolutely stunning because of that. So to sit there and, and get too picky about exposure or because you're going for what you see in your head and it may not be at all what would be considered normal. Absolutely. Proper, you know. And since we're talking about technicalities here uh, and, you know, we always have to, uh, to, to, to be a little bit geeky because we all, we all love technology. Uh, whoever does photography nowadays has to appreciate the, the technology, I think. Uh, right. Can you can you go through your uh, your uh, your experience in photography? What what kind of uh, gear you started with, and what you're using today, and what changes we, you've seen, and, and maybe a struggle if because uh, I believe you started with film. And I'm guys, I'm not judging. You know, I'm not saying this because he's got some white gray hair. It's not that, <laughs> but I just suspect <laughs> that he started with film. Uh, so how's been your journey from film to uh, to digital? Well, of course, I started shooting in 1972, and of course, all we had was film. And I had a, a, a rather large studio in Philadelphia, and it was literally a half a block long in uh, downtown Philadelphia. And I had everything from an 11 by 14 Deerdorf, an 8 by 10 Deerdorf. I had uh, Canon 35s. I had a Hasselblad 500. Um, I mean, I was I was equipment poor, you know. And I often say to people. My first good and larger was an old Bessler 23C2 that I bought brand new for $195. Today, I can't buy software for $195. And, you know, the beauty of the, of the equipment that I had was that it would last forever. Today, I mean, I bought, you know, I, I, we talked earlier, I bought two Fuji X100s to, to take to Europe with us last, uh, last month, and they cost me... 2400 for the two of them, because it's my wife and I, we always have to buy two things. But, and it's already outdated. I've only had it for like four months. It's crazy what's happened because, again, in the film world, you bought a Nikon, you bought a Canon, and the thing was good until it just gave up. Then we went through uh, the period of uh, about, I come along. I bought some contacts. I loved my contacts. It's beautiful glass on that thing. And then I met my wife about 10 or 15 years ago. And um, don't tell her I said 10 or 15 years. 10, 11 and a half years ago and 7.30 in the morning. Anyway, um, I bought her, her first, the first digital I'd ever even seen. And we're in a shoot together. And I remember saying to her, I'll never go digital. I'll always shoot film. And it's funny because I would watch her and she'd go, I don't like that one. Click. I don't like that one. Either. Oh, that's a good one. I'm going, and I'm sitting here unloading my camera, taking the ectochrome down to the lab, waiting four days to get the, the results back. And so eventually about a month later, I went digital and I've never looked back. And digital has been a godsend. I mean, you can do things in digital 
every track. The only great thing about having the film background is you can you can do things with your brain that you I don't think that you can visualize in digital. You know what I mean? It's hard to explain, but you can visualize things that you did in film that that people who have never my wife has never seen a dark room. She doesn't know what one looks like. Did you develop your own film? I'm sorry? Were, were you used to developing your own film? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the only film I didn't develop was my own. I, I didn't do C41. I did most of my own ectochrome. I obviously didn't do Kodachrome, and I shot a lot of that. But black and white, absolutely. I, I used to mix my own uh, black and white developers from scratch. Mm. It was crap, but it was like, oh, my God, have you got 12 days? You know? <laughs> I, I, you, you sit there, you do a little scale and your uh, eye of newt, mix it up, and then um, and then develop it because you had to use the stuff right away, and then you had to hang it up, and then you go into the lab. And if I came out of the lab in three days with one print, I was happy. Today, I can sit down on my on my Epson, I can do a, I can uh, process a print and have it ready to go in twenty minutes. Yeah. Why would I go back to film? <laughs> you know? And of course, the only hang up with digital, where I was going with the original story, was that today, my God, every time you turn around, you went from a 16 megapixel camera to like the new <clears throat> D800 Nikon, 33 megapixels. Next next week, it'll be another one. You, you can't keep up with it. That's why you guys need to not spend, if you starting photography, and you have a limited budget. If you're not Bill Gates and you're really wor wary about your budget, do not spend all your dough on your camera. Spend it on nope. your glass. Your glass will last as long as you remain within the same brand. So if you choose, go for Canon or go for Nikon. We don't really care at this stage. But make sure you mm -hmm. spend all your money on the glass because that's what is responsible for your picture overall. Right. The rest, you know, in five years' time, you will change your camera. It will come with a flipping screen. It will come with what? I don't know what. But you will want to upgrade it. So, um, so because we've seen some of your art now, I've just switched the screen and we um, we're seeing the Venus uh, Venus rising. So it's no longer black and white. It's still nude, but it's it's beautiful. We see the reflection of of water uh, made in post production. For those of you guys who were wondering, uh, quite similar to one of my exposure a reflection on life. If you go check it out. Uh, but really nice, uh, beautiful picture. And that leads me to. Um, to a question, a general question regarding portrait photography. I've noticed, I think in the past few years, um, there's one word that came to fashion and that's bokeh or bokeh or whatever people pronounce it. And uh, basically what I'm going to blur. with, sorry? I call it blur. <laughs> or oh, blur. <laughs> <laughs> but that leads me to that question where people are obsessed with uh, extreme wide aperture and believe that they need to get a 1.2 they need to get a 1.4 and they will sh they believe that they will shoot with 1.2 and 1.4 despite the fact that most of you if you guys don't know it uh, it's not because your lens can do 1.4 that at 1.4 is going to be the sharpest so just bear in mind on this one and if you don't know what I'm talking about just go check uh, some of my uh, past videos where I mentioned that already but how First of all, I was there's two questions for you. What lens do you use, and are you uh, obsessed with bokeh, blurring out the background? What kind of aperture setting you usually uh, use? And obviously, that has an, that's based on the lens you choose most of the time. Sure. Yeah, I um, first of all, um, uh, I almost always shoot at f/8, almost always. So it's and my <laughs> favorite. Yeah. yeah, and the reason for it is because if you're shooting, especially if you're shooting women, um, and you focus on their eyes, the problem is if a shot comes along that you don't, you're not quite focused on properly, at least F8 will kind of make up for it a little bit if you're not focused on the eyes the way I like to. The second thing is most lenses, in, including zooms in particular, don't really get good until about F8, maybe even F11. And so that's the reason I, I shoot at F8. And then finally, my favorite lens is the 24 to 105 Canon, the L lens, and it's about 
man, it's about as sharp as a prime. I mean, it, it, it's, it's got some places it falls apart, and it does vignette a bit at 24. But truthfully, I put that thing out at 105 and F8, and it's gorgeous, and it really is nice. What? So I always adjust my lighting for F8. Um, just going through some other work because I know the theme of the uh, the contest was uh, beauty in the nude, and that's the reason why we we discuss about those uh, those portrait of uh, of women. Uh, but it's good to know that uh, you is not only a nude uh, photographer, <laughs> not only photographing in the nude. That's not what I'm saying. Right. But <laughs> it's it's very sad, Tom. It's very sad to watch. <laughs> what 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 is very sad to watch? You in the nude. In the nude, shooting, yes. <laughs> and um, and so let's let's go through some of uh, some of your work uh, and, and one for you that uh, one for you guys that I found interesting. If you guys don't know what that is, um, that's an infrared uh, photograph. So what it is uh, that one? Actually, uh, you uh, tell us what you use to, uh, to to shoot this, and if you could uh, actually give us a definition of what infrared photography is as well. Well, infrared, uh, obviously, it's a different. You're, you're picking up a different spectrum, and in digital, in the old days, I go back to the old days again. Back in the day, before Lincoln, um, we would actually use infrared film, which you had to load in the camera in a dark room, generally, or a changing bag, and you had to use a, a infrared filter. You could, if you were using a single lens reflex, you couldn't see through the silly thing because it was so dark. Now today, I had uh, I had my uh, my old 20D Canon. I had it converted to an infrared, and all they do is they just take basically one of the filters off the uh, the lens. It's really silly that they charge you 300 bucks for it, but they take one of the filters off the sensor so that you can shoot in infrared, and so you get a very small spectrum. The levels, I mean, it's like all gathered into the middle if you do it properly. There's very little detail until you process it in black and white and that the, 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 the look, I mean, there's no mistaking it. And the only problem with modern digital infrared is that it's almost too sharp because old infrared was very grainy, uh, was kind of blurry. And, uh, but you know, that shot that you're talking about, uh, Mickey D, um, that one, it turned out perfect. There was enough green that it turned white. There was enough, uh, uh, you know, architecture, and it was a great shot. I love it. That's one of my favorite ones. I yeah. truly invite you guys to go see uh, U Smith uh, Gallery on Fine Art America. Uh, you, as you can see here on the screen, uh, I just uh, went to the gallery page, and you can see he's got some street photography. He's got some great shot of Ireland and France and Italy as well. The Italy one, you know, when I always tell you guys that the most important thing in photography is really to share a message, go check out the Italy uh, pictures because they're just brilliant. You feel Italy uh, when, you, when you watch them. It's, it's really brilliant. So uh, go there, go check the nudes. Uh, that's fantastic stuff. Uh, you you really learn by just looking at uh, at them by the light and figure out what angle works and the poses and I will surely sorry I will surely get back to those uh, pictures myself to uh, to get inspired for uh, for new poses so uh, I invite you to do that uh, there's another website as well that I should mention for you uh, and that's called uh, jargonart.com go there this is um, this is use and Diane. Uh, website uh, where you will have all the detail of his uh, of their work, uh, whether it's a portrait or any other type of work that they're doing. It's, it's really fantastic. And finally, for those of you who are like me and like you, who really appreciate uh, the nude in general. Uh, there's a there's a really uh, great source of uh, of inspiration on this website. It's called Art of the Muse. Com. Go check it out. He's got some fantastic shots there. And uh, it, it's really brilliant. So go for it. Uh, you, I really thank you so much for, uh, for uh, participating in this video. Um, and uh, once again, congratulations, not so much on uh, being the winning shot, but so much on uh, on your work because it's it's just brilliant stuff. Uh, I appreciate I, I've learned and got inspired by, uh, by going through it, and I'm sure our audience will as well. So, guys, until next time, this is Tommy Good saying, if you like it, capture it. <laughs>